important. It's important to do to ideally put in a green cannula, an 18 gauge, into an anticubital vein, rather than on the back of the hand with a small cannula, because both calcium and 50% dextrose are, are sort of irritant to the vein. So um, that's what's best. So we're going to talk about fatal biliary disease. Um, there's quite a lot of content to cover, uh, so this is, and this is very much tall, aimed towards MCQ style. I'm, I'm not going to try and touch on OSCEs and examinations. Uh, if you've got any questions, please interrupt, um, and we'll try and do questions as we go through. I think the, the slides are online. There are a couple of, li couple of little changes, and I'll point them out. Um, if we don't get through it all, then we don't. Is it, in theory, half an hour and 15 minutes? Yeah. Okay, right. So, we're going to start off with overview of jaundice um, and gallstones, then talk about cirrhosis, and if we've got time, then uh, the rest of the liver disease, really. Um, so, liver always seems to be a mysterious organ, as people find it. It's got quite varied functions, but the most important ones are that it's the synthetic centre of the body, produces all the proteins, and notably the clotting factors and albumin. Clotting factors being your short half-life measure of hepatic synthetic function, whereas albumin being the non-half-life, sort of three weeks measure of hepatic synthetic function. And it's the main organ for metabolism in terms of blood glucose and fats and proteins. So the liver is the only organ that helps you to increase your blood glucose other than what you eat. Because you can't use muscle stored glycogen for your blood. Um, the liver produces bile. The bile is needed for fat absorption and excretion of various compounds most commonly with fat soluble compounds um, and then it's got some other complicated roles involving immunity and blood volume regulation so it interacts with the heart and the lungs and the kidneys I know that there's already been a talk about LFTs <coughs> just a very brief summary ALT and AST are marks of damage to hepatocytes so they only go up when hepatocytes have undergone lysis or necrosis, which means that the patient can have chronic liver disease but not have any raised ALT or AST unless there's any active damage to their hepatocytes. ALP and gamma GT um, are markers of biliary epithelial cell damage, so anything that's causing damage to the bile ducts or somewhere in the biliary tree or an obstruction to the bile flow, so cholestasis. Um, it's not completely exclusive though, so you get some mild rays in either one with, for example, a predominantly damaged their hepat hepatocytes does cause a mild rise in the ALP and gamma GT and vice versa. Um, always remember that alkaline phosphatase is also present in the bone and placenta. And gamma GT is the way of differentiating out biliary origin as opposed to a bone or placenta origin of raised ALT. And then, as I mentioned, albumin and clotting factors really are the markers of uh, liver function as opposed to liver damage, um, where clotting derangement would be your first sign of a failure of hepatic synthetic function. So, start talking about jaundice, um, and in simple essence, it's raised bilirubin, does anyone know roughly what figure bilirubin needs to get to before you can see it? Yeah, so 30 to 50 is usually what's quoted. Um, and you can classify it in terms of what kind of bilirubin it is or where the pathology is. And we're going to talk about it in terms of where the pathology is. Is it not really involving the liver, a prehepatic jaundice, one due to liver damage and intrahepatic jaundice? a problem with bile excretion, uh, post-hepatic, or obstructive jaundice. Um, so I've changed the, the slides slightly. So just 
need, you need, need to summarize this uh, production of bilirubin. Almost all of it comes from red blood cell breakdown, which makes heme, heme converted to bilirubin. That bilirubin is unconjugated, it's just on its own, and it's not soluble in water. So as it circulates in the blood, that bilirubin doesn't get filtered into the kidneys. It gets taken to the liver, it's acted on by an enzyme called UGT, which conjugates it, so it sticks on a glucuronide group onto the bilirubin, and that makes it soluble in water. Once it's soluble, it's then able to be excreted via the bile into the bowel, and then from then on, it's acted on by bacterial enzymes in the bowel. So that first conversion is to something called urobilinogen, um, and the urobilinogen is normally reabsorbed in part, and then travels back via the bloodstream, some of which gets left in the kidneys. So urinary urobilinogen is a normal finding and demonstrates the presence of bilirubin getting into the bowel. It then gets converted to a brown pigment, pigment called stercobilinogen, and that's what causes stool to be brown. So if you're not getting any bilirubin into the bowel, you wouldn't have urobilinogen, and your stool is pale because you've got no stercobilinogen. If you have a conjugated bilirubin in the blood, the bilirubin glucuronide, that's water soluble, so it can be seen in the urine, and makes the urine dark. So just sort of there, summarized. So if you've got a conjugated hyperbilirubinemia, then you get dark stools if it's obstruct a dark urine. If it's obstructive, you also have an absence of urobilinogen in the urine and pale stools. Prehepatic jaundice um, is almost always due to either hemolysis or a condition called Gilbert syndrome. In most cases, the LFTs are normal. So if you're presented in your MCQs and it's a range of LFTs and just the bilirubin is up, it's reasonable to assume that it's a prehepatic jaundice. What kind of tests would you do to differentiate the cause of a prehepatic jaundice? What do you say? No. Oh, here we go. I was going to say split the bilirubin into conjugated and unconjugated. Yeah, so you can, you can prove it by asking for a direct and an indirect bilirubin, where a raised indirect bilirubin is a raised unconjugated fraction. But if we're thinking about a hemolysis or Gilbert's, what tests would we do? Coombs. So Coombs and, does someone say blood film? Yes, so Coombs test and the blood film. So Coombs test broadly is looking for anti um, an antibody-mediated hemolysis. Um, and then a blood film, you can look for evidence of hemolysis. Anyone know any other blood tests that you could do to look for evidence of hemolysis. You can do a look for a lactate, so a lactate dehydrogenase or raised lactate, um, but raised LDH particularly. What does that show? So a raised LDH um, is a feature of hemolysis and also you can get some called reduced haptoglobin. <coughs> it's a protein that binds free hemoglobin. So haptoglobin goes down if you've got excess free hemoglobin. The classical case that you get for a condition called Gilbert syndrome is 50 year old man has, his, uh, has a hernia operation. It all goes fine. Um, but the next day he's found to be, he, he appears jaundice. All his LFTs are normal apart from a raised bit of Reuben. He says this has happened before. Um, he feels fine. There's no abnormalities on examination. And that's this case where in Gilbert syndrome, patients, when they come under some form of stress, which can be surgery, illness, starvation, the expression of UGT goes down, which means despite the fact they're producing a, a normal amount of bilirubin, they're not able to conjugate it. And because it's, 
an un a raised unconjugated fraction, their stools and their urine still appear normal, and all their other LFTs are normal. What advice would you give to someone with Gilbert syndrome? Do they have to be worried? No. Yeah, so you can say there's nothing to worry about and tell tell doctors if it happens again because otherwise they might end up having all sorts of investigations to try and find out the cause. Does anyone know the name of another rare paediatric condition that sort of mimics Gilbert's? Yeah, Kriglin and Jar. Yeah. One for, one for bonus points, paediatrics. So, it's prehepatic jaundice. Intrahepatic jaundice is almost always conjugated hypobilirubinemia because the liver has capacity, will almost always conjugate all the bilirubin it has, even if there's only 10% of the liver functioning. So, in acute viral hepatitis, it's usually a raised conjugated fraction. But the liver is still excreting the bilirubin through the bile, therefore stools still appear dark, but with a raised conjugated fraction you get dark urine. So for example, a classic exam question would be, uh, man comes back from holiday in Egypt, he feels like he's got flu, he then notices his eyes are yellow, his bilirubin is 100, his ALT is 1000, his urine is dark, his stools are still dark. Think of some kind of acute viral hepatitis, A or E. <coughs> but broadly, um, the causes of intrahepatic jaundice are sort of anything that can damage the liver, both acutely or chronically, um, including paracetamol poisoning is an important one, never to be missed. Um, Sort of acute on chronic would be decompensated cirrhosis, which we'll talk about in a bit. Any of the any of the hepatitis viruses, A to E, all the metabolic diseases, especially alcoholic and non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, NAFLD, um, autoimmune hepatitis, and the biliary diseases. <coughs> now, what's standing for? What's PBC? Yeah, and, and primary sclerosis and cholangitis. So, despite the fact that both of them predominantly affect the bile ducts, um, they both can lead to cirrhosis. Therefore, they both could be considered to be a cause of intrahepatic jaundice. And drugs as well. So, drugs are quite an important one. Um, can anyone name a drug that can cause liver damage? Yeah, good one, Rapamacin. What do you say? Iso, I can't say it. Iso, isoniazid. Yeah, isoniazid. Kind of almost all the, almost all the, all the TV drugs apart from uh, ephambitol. Um, any others? A very common paracetamol, of course. There's an antibiotic that we give for cellulitis. So flu clocks. Um, Patients on, who are on high dose flu clocks should have their LFTs monitored weekly or sort of twice weekly because people do go into liver failure from flu clocks. Post hepatic jaundice is kind of a surgical thing usually. Um, we've got something stopping the outflow of bile, bile refluxes back, and the conjugated bilirubin spills it out into the blood. It's conjugated, so it's water soluble, so the, your urine goes dark. Because you block the flow into the bowel, none gets into the bowel, no stercobilinogen, therefore your stool is pale, no urinary urobilinogen, because none's being reabsorbed. The key investigation is an ultrasound. So you do an ultrasound, and what you're looking for is a dilated duct. So if you've got a dilated common bile duct, that suggests that there's some obstruction below the common bile duct that's causing back pressure. If you've got dilated intrahepatic ducts and a normal common bile duct, that would suggest some obstruction further up, say in the common hepatic duct. 
<coughs> the best way to think about the causes are like any obstruction in the lumen, in the wall, and outside. So, gallstones is the most common of cause of an obstructive jaundice, um, and we'll talk about them in a moment. In the wall, really, it's only strictures and cancer. Um, so, does anyone know anything about cholangiocarcinoma? It's really aggressive. It's really bad. No, but it is really, really bad. It's really sad. People get up when they're quite young. Um, does anyone know any conditions that predispose to cholangiocarcinoma? PSC. So it's kind of PSC patients tend to get cholangiocarcinomas. Um, and then the other one not to be missed is cancer of the head of the pancreas causing obstructive jaundice. Any questions about jaundice, bilirubin, and sort of principles behind it? It's about recognising the patterns <coughs> of the raised liver enzymes and correlating it to the symptoms. Um, and exam questions can be phrased in any which way. So, for example, they could give you a set of LFTs and then ask what symptoms they're going to get. So, that's what I'm going to have. So, gallstones, um, it, it, it's all about where it is and exactly where it is, um, which defines the pathology and the symptoms. There are these poor jokes all the way through if you have this, they could carry on. Um, and the, the anatomy is quite important. So, right and left hepatic ducts make common hepatic duct, which is joined by the common the cystic duct to make the common bile duct, um, which joins the pancreatic duct at the ampulla of vata, enters into the duodenum of the sphincter body. So, if you have a stone in the cystic duct, blocking the cystic duct completely, does the patient become jaundiced? No. Great. So, just remember that, because people always get confused. So. In theory, if you've got a blocked gallbladder, you don't get jaundice just from that. The stone must be somewhere else, say anywhere along here or up to here, to cause back pressure and an obstruction to bile flow. If you've got a stones just sitting in the base of the gallbladder, not obstructing it, um, and people look up, then the, the typical presentation is biliary colic. That's where the gallbladder is contracting on the stones and they're getting pain from that. But the gallbladder itself isn't infected and it isn't particularly inflamed. When you have a stone that blocks the outflow of the gallbladder, then the gallbladder becomes inflamed and they've got a stagnant pool of fluid and like anywhere in the body it gets infected. That's your acute cholecystitis. And if you have the same thing, stagnant pool of bile, but in the bile duct, that's cholangitis. Um, does anyone know what the, the anatomical name for this area is? Pouch. Good knowledge. Yeah, Hartman's pouch. So if you bring that one out, you'll, you'll really impress them. Um, so biliary colic patients are relatively well. They're the people who kind of come along saying, oh, I've got a bit of pain. They don't have a fever. They are not clinically peritonitic. <clears throat> they might have ever so slightly raised inflammatory <coughs> markers, but generally they're just a person with pain. The typical story is the fat mid middle-aged lady who eats fish and chips gets right up a quadrant pain. Um, but it can be more vague. The one thing to note is that it's described as being a colicky pain, which you'd assume is intermittent, comes and goes. But it's very commonly actually quite constant. It might get a little bit worse and a bit better, but it doesn't truly come and go, unlike renal colic, where patients can be rolling around and then better. If you do an ultrasound, there should be no dilated ducts. And the gallbladder will look relatively normal, or it might look a bit old and fibrosed from chronic cholecystitis, but it won't be swollen and edematous, unlike an acute cholecystitis, where the stone's blocking the outflow, they've got an infected viscera, so 
they probably have a fever, they've got raised white cell count, high CRP, um, they're generally unwell. Their pain is a bit different. They might have started out with a bit of bitter colic pain, but it's more continuous. Um, what clinical sign is sort of textbook for acute cholecystitis? Okay, so someone would define Murphy's sign, exactly. Pain stops inspiration on pressing in the right hand. And? Isn't that on the left? Yeah, it's greater on the right hand side than the left. So, the way it says is you go on the left in sort of the mid, roughly mid clavicular line, pressure just under the costal margin, and then ask them to take a deep breath in. And they might get a, a bit of pain there. But if you do the same on the right hand side, they get much greater pain but as the, the gallbladder descends and hits the hand. That's the theory. And examiners are often particular about the fact that it has to be greater on the right than on the left. Because if it was the same on both sides, what would you be thinking of? Peritonitis. Say peritonitis or pancreatitis, mm -hmm. either one. So something else. Um, it could still be cholecystitis, but They're, they might well have a slightly raised ALT, um, AST, sort of around 50, 60, 70, and slightly raised gamma GT and ALP as well. And the thing that you tend to read on the ultrasound reports is edematous gallbladder with stone impacted in neck or stone in cystic duct. Cholangitis um, is, again, the classical description is Charcot's triad, um, which is right upper quadrant pain and obstructive jaundice and rigors. Does anyone know what Reynolds pentad is? Is it if it extends to um, have hypertension or tachycardia or something like that? It's too Yeah, yeah. Well done. Um, so Reynolds pentad is shark. Is, this is just for fun. Like I wouldn't worry about it too much. Um, with with shock and altered mental status. Obviously, this is Charcot's triad for right upper quadrant pain, not to be confused with Charcot's triad for multiple sclerosis, which is like nystagmus, relative afferent papillary defect and something else. But there are two. So Basically, the patient is really unwell because they've got um, ascending infection in, their, in the bile duct, um, hugely raised uh, LFTs. They can have bilirubins in the hundreds. Um, on the ultrasound, you see a dilated common bile duct or a dilated hepatic duct. Um, and the figure given is over six millimeters for the bile duct suggests dil um, dilatation. What's the, so the, the further investigations that are done are either an MRCP, not the examination, but the, um, the uh, a magnetic re resonance cholangiopancreatography or an ERCP. What's the, do you know why one would be done and not the other? Yeah, so ERCP allows you to do the treatment, but why would you do an MRCP? ERCP tries a higher risk. Yeah, so, so an ERCP is, first it's relatively invasive, you do an OGD and then split the sphincter body and then go all the way up and there's a risk of pancreatitis, there's a risk of contrast reaction, um, there's the risk of the actual sedation and everything in itself. Um, and also there's the fact that scheduling, often you'll find in hospitals, ERCPs are only done on a Tuesday. In a, D, in a DGH, so they might do an MRCP in the meantime to confirm the position. What medical treatment is given to cholangitis and cholecystitis? Antibiotics. antibiotics. Which antibiotics? Yeah, Kef and Met, because it's usually an anaerobic infection. But it's always reasonable in your exams to say with antibiotics. Um, it's always reasonable to say, I would consider the hospital's local guidelines, but for example, a cephalosporin and, and um, metronidazole would be appropriate. 
uh, and fluid resuscitation and analgesia and sort of appropriate things. But really, with cholangitis, you need to get the stone out. With acute cholecystitis, usually they treat it medically, and then when they're better, <coughs> take the gallbladder out. Is there any difference in sending cholecystitis if they just two words? My understanding is that there are two different words for the same thing. Because I can't understand how you have descending cholangitis. So I just, I, I, I've never heard it, them being separated out. Someone define core fuzzy as an orphanage, please. Ian, what's the definition of core fuzzy as an Okay. Okay. So right. So so the the the, the law goes that in the setting of an obstructive jaundice, if there is a palpable gallbladder, it is unlikely to be due to gallstones. Why? Because it should be like, up. Yeah. So a patient who has gallstones um, has some degree of chronic cholecystitis. Like any form of chronic inflammation, it results in fibrosis and contraction of the organ. So they have a, a small shriveled gallbladder, which then, in the setting of an obstructive jaundice, won't expand to become palpable. So that would suggest that a patient who has gallstones, the gallstones won't be causing the obstructive jaundice because their gallbladder wouldn't be able to expand. So you just need to investigate for other causes like cancer of the head of the pancreas. So it's often used to be sort of, oh, call Vosier's law suggests this is cancer of the head of the pancreas. But it's, it could be other things like cholangiocarcinoma or um, lymph node obstruction. Okay. Any questions about gallstones or jaundice or anything we've gone through so far? How does um, cholangiocarcinoma present? Um, exactly like cancer of the head of the pancreas, painless, painless obstructive jaundice with weight loss, um, anorexia. Then they do sort of a ultrasound scan dilated ducts, you might do an MRCP or an ERCP, and the, and the, the classical description is a dominant, strict, dominant stricture in the bile ducts. So the confusing thing is then that if a patient who has primary sclerosing cholangitis, they commonly get these strictures that develop in the bile ducts, and then they have this one really big stricture, and the question is, is that a cancer or is that just another benign stricture? So that's a whole different question. So then they can try and take biopsies or stuff like that. Is it cancer of the bile duct? Yeah, biliary epithelial cell malignancy. You often, often inoperable, poorly responded, poorly poor response to uh, chemotherapy, mean survival is less than six months. Is there an age group? The people I've seen with it are relatively young. Yeah. Most of them have PSC. Can occur in old people. Also more common in cirrhosis. Uh, I don't know if you can more about it. That's probably, probably enough to find us. Any other questions? Okay. So, uh, is cirrhosis a diagnosis? No, cirrhosis is not a diagnosis. It's merely a pathology. It's like saying someone has lung fibrosis or they have um, uh, yeah, myocarditis. It's not a, a diagnosis. It's just how the liver looks under a microscope. Um, and the three features are that you've got disruption of the architecture, the normal lobular asthma structure, and with big bands of fibrous tissue going through it. And that means you're interrupting the normal portal blood flow in, which is why you get portal hypertension. And then you've got these great big nodules that grow back, 
So they've got a high rate of hepatocyte turnover. And that's what causes them to have an increased risk of hepatocellular carcinoma. <coughs> Cirrhosis doesn't occur with acute liver damage. So if someone has an acute ischemic hepatitis, or one paracetamol overdose, or acute viral hepatitis, that doesn't cause cirrhosis. It's got to be something ongoing. And the causes of cirrhosis are broadly the same as the list I've put up before for causes of intrahepatic jaundice, um, except it's not including the acute causes. So I've taken out hepatitis A and E, um, and I've taken out paracetamol overdose, but more or less the others. Drugs is extremely rare as a cause of cirrhosis. That shouldn't really be on there, I'm sorry. So the way I think of cirrhosis is that two problems, uh, which are um, independent events. They're not mutually exclusive. So you've got portal hypertension, because you can't get the portal blood in, and then Due to la loss of normal hepatocyte function, you get liver failure or hepa hepatocyte failure. But in most people with cirrhosis, it's compensated. In the same way that people with chronic kidney disease uh, are not walking around with hugely high potassiums and clinically uremic. Um, most people with cirrhosis have, have got preserved hepatic synthetic function. So their clotting is normal. They're not encephalopathic. So it's common for most people with cirrhosis have features of portal hypertension, but not hepatic failure. <coughs> until they have some kind of event that causes them to decompensate, and then they develop a decompensated cirrhosis or acute on chronic liver failure. But it's both of these together that cause your, your features of chronic liver disease that you look for on examination. So, well, should we name some? Should we try and get to 15? <laughs> Palmer erythema. Palmer erythema. Ascites. Ascites. Spider, Spider nevi. Spider nevi. Capital. 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 Yeah. Gangan. Yeah, good one. Varices. Duperatrins. Hair loss. Yeah, loss of hair. Oh, we have colonicia, but I accept leukonicia. Yeah, good. <laughs> We'll stop at 10, there's loads. So they're from a combination of both. But portal hypertension per se, um, the, the problems really occur due to your portosystemic anastomoses. So this is where the buildup of pressure on the portal system is then pushed blood through back into the systemic system to try and get out. At the esophagus they cause varices, which I'll, I'll talk about in a moment. And Back pressure along the splenic vein causes the spleen to enlarge. Um, the clinical manifestation of that is hypersplenism, where the platelets then get trapped and they get thrombocytopenia. So low platelets, in fact, is a very good marker of um, portal hypertension. It correlates quite well. The anastomoses in the rectum cause hemorrhoids. Um, they get caput medusae because the umbilical, the umbilical vein recanalizes and they get this caput medusae. Um, has anyone heard of portal gastropathy before? So basically all over the stomach they can get these dilated veins. Imagine the appearance of esophageal varices but in the stomach. Just for extra. Um, ascites occurs due to a combination of portal hypertension and liver failure. Um, the mechanism is quite complicated, but if you were asked to explain it, you can just say portal pressure backs up, and there's poor reabsorption of fluid from the, uh, uh, from the peritoneal cavity, which would normally be reabsorbed through into the portal circulation. You'd normally do a, um, a peritoneal tap to test it, some patients have paracentesis, so where they take up off quite large volumes regularly. Spironolactone is the diuretic usually used to manage it in the first instance, and then on top of it, then they start adding in loop diuretics. Um, SBP, or spontaneous bacterial peritonitis, 
is uh, quite a dangerous condition where patients who have ascites and more rarely people who don't have ascites can get bad infection of the peritoneum and they can become extremely unwell. No uh, there are increased risk of portal vein thrombosis and has anyone heard of hepatorenal syndrome? Yeah. Yeah. It's, uh, it's quite confusing, but broadly they get renal failure due to their liver failure. If you treat their renal failure, their if you treat their liver failure, their renal failure gets better. In most cases of hepatorenal syndrome. Pharisees, the sort of varicose veins at the base of the esophagus. Medically treated with beta blockers. They're monitored with regular endoscopy to see if they're enlarging. And then if they are, then they can be banded. That's the best method where they, like the hemorrhoids, tie a little band around them and they slowly drop off. Or sclerotherapy where they inject a sclerose into them. They sort of, um, well, fibros. If they bleed, then they get bad upper GI bleeds, but I'm not going to go into the management of that today. Yeah, beta blockers and regular OGDs. Um, so, ascites just is not always liver. Um, you can classify it like a pleural effusion into transudates and exudates. Exudates all your inflammatory things, transudates all your hydrostatic pressure things. So right-sided cardiac failure is quite an important cause of ascites to remember. In uh, elderly and middle-aged <coughs> women, what do you need to think about for or consider the causes of ascites? <laughs> yeah, ovarian cancer, good. Um, and then inflammatory and infected causes, relatively rare. What iatrogenic cause of ascites is there that you can think of? <coughs> what do you say? Shunt. Shunt? Yeah. Good one, I hadn't thought of that. So you can have a bit ventricular peritoneal shunts in some patients with hydrocephalus. And uh, peritoneal dialysis. Pouring 10 litres of fluid into their abdomen, they're at increased risk of um, their increased risk of peritonitis. So, uh, I realise we're going at quite a pace. Please do stick your hand up or shout out if you've got any questions. To compensate in cirrhosis, um, the liver is still functioning and you haven't got any features of failure, but you can still have portal hypertension and therefore still be at risk of varices and under the regular OGDs and all this kind of thing. So the three cardinal features of liver failure are encephalopathy, coagulopathy, and hypoglycemia. Um, but they tend to also come with worsening jaundice, worsening ascites, um, infection, which is actually the most common cause of death in liver failure, and hypoalbuminemia. But obviously there's a whole host of reasons why they could have all these things. But if you're on the end of a telephone to the liver reg, you know, I'm worried my patient's in acute liver failure. And so they're, they're encephalopathic and we're having to put them on dextrose to maintain their blood glucose. And, but their INR is maintained at 1.3. That's the kind of things they want to know. Do you have to have cirrhosis before? It's like cirrhosis, like a stepping stage to hepatic failure, or can you have hepatic failure without cirrhosis? Uh, yep. What's most common cause of liver failure in the absence of cirrhosis? Oh. Cirrhosis. Oh, yeah. yeah. So, decompensation of chronic liver disease would be in the setting of cirrhosis. Um, but it, there are causes of acute liver failure, most commonly paracetamol overdose. Chronically, chronic chronic is cirrhosis. Yeah. Um, yeah, I can't really think of any other. Yeah, I can't. chronic liver disease implies cirrhosis. Um, you can get 
funny things like non cirrhotic portal hypertension, though, which is interesting if you like portal hypertension. <laughs> um, does that answer your question? Uh, coagulopathy of liver disease is, a, is quite a nice question for examiners to ask you. So, why do people bleed with liver failure? The liver stops making clotting factors. You need bile to absorb fat. Vitamin K is a fat soluble vitamin, and therefore you don't absorb any vitamin K, so that worsens your clotting derangement if you've got obstruction of the bile flow. So, people with obstructive jaundice should probably be on IM um, vitamin K regularly. Um, they've got low platelets, and also the, the toxins that build up in liver failure worsen their platelet dysfunction. Five minutes. Um, so, one of my personal bugbears, hepatitis does not mean viral hepatitis. It just means liver inflammation in general. Um, and you generally get this hepatitic picture on LFTs with raised ALT and AST. Um, and raised bit of Rubin. Reasonable tests to do are viral serology for the hepatitis viruses. What are, the, what are the viruses are normally tested for? CMV. Yeah, CMV and EBV. And if you're testing for Hep C, then often they'll test for HIV. At the same, it's reasonable to consent a patient to a test for HIV at the same time if you think that they've been exposed to the same risk factors. Um, need to test for autoantibodies. There are three, three which are probably most important to test for, which are. AMA, so anti mitochondrial antibody, SMA. smooth muscle, and anti, um, anti uh, nuclear, so ANA. Where ANA and anti smooth muscle are your autoimmune hepatitis, anti mitochondrial is very strongly associated with primary biliary cirrhosis. And then if it's an acute thing, you need to do a paracetamol level. So, quick way to remember hepatitis viruses, A and E, acute, C stands for chronic, B stands for both. So, A and E are only ever cause an acute hepatitis and a fecal oral, fecal oral transmission. C is only ever chronic and the most common method worldwide for transmission is iatrogenic. So, for example, in the Middle East, when people go to the doctor, the doctor has five needles, and then if you're the sixth person who needs a needle in the day, then you get a previously used needle. So, whereas in the UK, the most um, common method for transmission is intravenous drug use, <coughs> but it's got quite a high rate of chronicity, unlike hepatitis B in the adult. So, in adults, you're very unlikely to develop chronic hepatitis B. Whereas in children, they are very likely to develop chronicity. So if you've got a 40-year-old man with chronic hepatitis B, and he says he once had sex with a prostitute when he was 35, that is unlikely to be the cause of his chronic hepatitis B. It's much more likely that he had it perinatal transmission from the mother. So just... Before we finish, I want to go through the minefield that is hepatitis B serology. Um, I've tried to sort of relatively simplify it down to two antigens. So the surface antigen, if that is present in medicine and blood, HBS antigen, um, that demonstrates that the person has some form of hepatitis B virus in their body at that time, some kind of current infection. If someone has the antibody to the surface antigen, that means they don't have the antigen, they don't have hepatitis B in them, but they have been exposed at some stage. So they either have a previous infection that's been cleared, or they've been immunised. So when, for example, they measure our immunisation level, they're measuring the antibody level. E is sort of a an antigen that comes out when hepatitis B replicates and it indicates current infection and replicating. 
An anti-E antibody means that you're re mounting a response to an infection. So you'll only have that if you're um, if you're stopping them replicate and you have been actually exposed. So if someone's S positive, E positive, then they've got the virus and they're making more viruses. If they're S positive but E antibody positive, then they've got the <coughs> virus, but because they're E antibody positive, they're not actively making any more. If you can imagine, there's a spectrum between the two. So chronic hepatitis B patients have varying levels of E antigen, E antibody, and then there's another one, C, and that's where it gets really confusing. But if you just, chronic inactive is S antigen positive, E antibody positive. Because this stops them replicating. A previous infection is someone who has been exposed, so they're S antibody positive and E antigen, uh, E antigen, E antibody positive. So they've been exposed and they've stopped them replicating and they've had the virus and they've cleared it. Whereas if you've been immunized, you're only S antibody positive because you've been given the S antigen, immunised against it, but have never actually had the virus, so have never mounted a response to hepatitis B replication. In the textbooks, they will go through more with C antibody and antigen and dividing out IgM and IgG, um, which is nice, but this is four which you can just sort of learn in the first instance. Uh, very quickly, last thing. PBC is only intrahepatic. It doesn't cause biliary strictures. It's a classic. It's a relatively classic autoimmune disease, so it's associated with thyroid disease. It's more common in women. Whereas PBC, PSC, primary sclerosing cholangitis, causes strictures. More common in men, and is associated with inflammatory bowel disease. So. They sound quite similar, but they're actually extremely different. And both can cause cirrhosis, but only PSC causes this. Uh, show gallstones, but um, only PSC causes strictures of the bile ducts. Um, I think we're more or less out of time. But um, just a metabolic disease. Nafold and hemochromatosis and subphrenic abscess and that's it. Do you think hemochromatosis is metabolic? Found in Nafold. So Nafold is the <laughs> <laughs> so Nafold the most common cause of abnormal LFTs in the UK and the US. In the US, it will very soon be the most common cause of cirrhosis, so it's pretty important. Basically, it's the metabolic syndrome in the liver and. Um, broadly, everyone with diabetes has some degree of NAFLD. NAFLD is the overarching term for fat in the liver, inflammation in response to fat in the liver, and cirrhosis due to fat in the liver. Um, but broadly, most people present at this stage when they have no features of NAFLD left. But if you have a patient on the ward and you do their bloods and they have slightly abnormal LFTs and they've got a BMI of 40 and type 2 diabetes, it's probably nappled. So it's important. Um, metabolic disease, really cool, really rare. Wilson disease, there's too much copper. Um, <coughs> you can't get rid of it from the hepatocytes. So they get liver damage and neurological damage, and then they can have these acute events where they throw up loads of copper, and they get renal failure and hemolysis.
but broadly it only happens to children. Does anyone know a, a particular sign in the eyes that they say you get? Kaiser Fleischer rings, yeah. So um, they can only be viewed correctly under a slit lamp. So uh, if you're doing a, 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 a liver examination or a GI examination and you, you say to the, the examiner, oh, I can see Kaiser Fleischer rings, you'll sound pretty stupid. So you could say, I could examine for Kaiser Fleischer rings if I had a slit lamp available. Um, so it's copper deposition in the edge of the cornea. Alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency is emphysema and cirrhosis. Broadly, people get problems with emphysema and not cirrhosis. They die from their lung problems, not from their liver problems. Hemochromatosis is one of the most common autosomal recessive conditions in Caucasians, and it's due to excessive iron absorption, not an inability to excrete iron, because we all are completely unable to excrete iron. We can't actually get iron out of the body. And their features are that they get cirrhosis, cardiomyopathy, and endocrine abnormalities. And it's described as being the bronzed diabetes because they're meant to appear tanned and also get diabetes. But the diabetes is sort of mild type 2 diabetes, sometimes diet controlled. Um, and often it's described as being a <coughs> slate grey appearance. So they kind of just look generally unwell rather than being kind of nice holiday to Mauritius type tan. Um, bonus question. Does anyone know what the typical osteoarthritis appearance for hemochromatosis is? Asymmetric polyarthropathy? Uh, but you could get them with any kind of osteoarthritis. But the, the, the typical one is the first and the, the second and the third MCP joints in the hand. But, yeah. So. Oh, and then subphrenic abscess. Yeah. <laughs> Pass and it's bad. Very ill. <laughs> Any questions about anything to do with the liver or the tree run? I appreciate there's a huge volume there. Um, but the most important bits, the bits we went through first, so LFTs, jaundice, gallstones.